Colin whilst um, he's getting robed up. So um, Colin trained as a geologist at the University of Auckland and worked for 20 years with the New Zealand Geological Survey and successor organisation, mainly undertaking regional geological mapping. Since 2003, he has been working for Mineral Resources Tasmania in the field of natural hazards and among a range of activities has produced landslide zoning maps across the state. Colin has over 30 years experience of geographical information system software, including QGIS. He is passionate about GIS and leads courses throughout the Australian Geomechanics Society and New Zealand Ge Geotechnical Society, empowering geotechnical practitioners in the use of GIS. Thanks, Colin. Thank you. Um, Bethany's talk reminded me of um, my late mother um, going through her iPad after she had died and finding a letter she had tried to write to us where she had written the whole letter in the subject line. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, yes, yeah, so I just want to briefly talk about uh, the work that I do here um, and why we do it. This is sort of a paraphrase of our mission statement, but um, it's about providing planning information tools for the public good, as you can see. It involves a number of um, activities, uh, compiling a landslide database. Uh, there's the geomorphic mapping, geological mapping. Um, we have a drill hole database from a core library that we um, extract information from. Uh, we have a mineralogy and geotechnical uh, properties database for the materials that are often involved in landslides. Uh, we have report and map catalogues. Um, we produce uh, susceptibility maps for uh, three different, uh, primarily three different types of uh, landslide process, rockfall, landslide and debris flow. Hang on. Oh, didn't mean to do that. Oh, I'm going backwards. Why am I going backwards? Okay, that's right. I'll hopefully. Ah, so why, why do we do it? Um, well, this is, this is why this uh, house is uh, on a landslide and uh, no longer habitable. You can't open the windows, it closed the doors. Um, and it just so happens this, uh, this house was destroyed along with one behind it in 2003, it was finally removed. Um, I'm now sort of firefighting next door to these properties as more houses are, are on the way down the, the slope. So who uses this information? Uh, well, local government are our primary um, end user. Um, so we've, we've produced a landslide hazard band layer. Um, so it's a planning tool. It has statutory status now that we have the single uh, planning scheme template and, and process for most councils now. Um, and it's also it's used by them uh, by councils as a trigger for landslide risk assessment. So when you submit your DA development application. If you're in one of these zones, then you need to get a geotech uh, report, and hopefully that geotech report uh, supports the application. Often they support it, even though you sort of wonder how can that be. Anyway, it's a different story. Um, but we, the civil engineering consultants in the state, we use this, particularly say the people who companies that work with state roads. Um, uh, you know, the Port Authorities, Bell Bay is one of the hotspots of landslides and so forth. So it's widely used, asset managers, um, other government agencies, be it Environment um, Protection Agency and so on, a lot of, lot of users. And of course the general public, um, it's been quite helpful for them, especially first home buyers or people looking at buying properties uh, will tend to use this, some of them will. Um, so that, what does it look like? That's uh, basically a, a screen grab showing um, uh, the classes that were produced. It's uh, uh, a whole variety of inputs. I'm not going to explain it all more than that. Um, an algorithm that ranks it into five classes and then those classes then trigger the sorts of uh, planning responses. So this is all on the list. It's all freely available. Um, that landslide database that I talked about is another layer that you can bring up and you can export that out as uh, exports out as um, as shape files at the stage. So uh, the, da the data is open and free to use. So how do we collect and assemble this? Um, 
the old fashioned way. When I started out, uh, it, uh, we didn't have computers, um, but the mapping tools were stereoscopes, and, and uh, which are things you look at through two eyes, look at photos, uh, stereo photo pairs, um, our compasses, our rock hammers, spades, all those kind of things, the old technology. Uh, now it's almost completely digital. Um, so I use, for example, a program called Field Move on an iPad tablet, and that has all just so many of the, the old tools which individually I have to lug around uh, are all in one, one system. And, and of course, in addition, there's range finders, digital stereoscopes where you use um, anaglyph glasses on screen with your two stereo images, does auto aligning and so forth. Um, it's a fantastic tool. In a, in a, a digital environment. Um, and of course, GIS is the way we compile this data now. So um, uh, a lot of our work, uh, a lot of my time is spent uh, staring at GIS systems and working with digital data. But we still haven't replaced the rock hammer or the spade and, and field work is still important. We still need to be able to understand the rocks and the materials that we see in the field. And that's really our challenge for the next generation with virtual courses, um, you know, being out in the field, knowing how to wear a raincoat and lug a uh, hammer and spade and whatever around is still a, an important skill and to navigate your way out of trouble. So just a few screen grabs. These are what some of the maps uh, look like. The geomorphology is all, all about understanding its, its surface processes. Um, this uh, hill shade on, on the left um, just shows a very rumpled, uh, hummocky landslide, uh, landscape um, and the interpretation on the right there where we've interpreted that as a big complex of, of landslides. And, and areas like this are being actively subdivided and developed by some fairly high senior people, including senior people in, in, in state government, I won't say who, who are subdividing their lands for this purpose. We would argue that you need to really do, do your due diligence if you're buying a property here and really understand is this really a good place to, to invest your life savings. So um, just something about a um, bit of science, process rates and, and geomorphology are really important. Um, when, when a landslide occurs and it's fresh, such as this one in the 1970s, by 2013 it's almost disappeared. So. Um, you know, collecting data in the field and uh, is is quite temporal. Um, the import that illustrates the importance of the uh, aerial photos, the uh, data collection going back to the 40s, and sometimes we have older photos as well. So um, uh, uh, the landscape is always evolving, especially when you've got farmers ploughing and so forth. So how do we do the mapping and modelling? Well, we compile the landslide inventory using the tools that I've talked about. Um, we revise and, and simplify the geology maps that, that we've provided. So when we're out in the field, if we see something which is different or needs adjusting, we do, but we also have to simplify that geology down into, into a few basic units. Now the geomorphic mapping I've talked about, the susceptibility mapping, I'll show you some one of the basics of, of that in a minute. Um, but that's all about understanding uh, geology and slope and how those are our two primary factors that um, we can relate landslides to. So a different a particular rock unit or geology unit uh, might fail at lower um, slope thresholds than, than another unit. So we're trying to categorise uh, our um, landscape into those sorts of terms. So how do we uh, select those parameters in terms of slope thresholds. Uh, I'll show you that how we go about that shortly. Um, we need to, once we identify those parameters, then uh, we'll determine those parameters, then we need to identify the areas that are above those thresholds because um, they are the areas that could fail. And then we model the, the run out, which is if the landslide moves, it's going to go downhill. Well, how far is it going to go? We've got some pretty simplistic tools for doing that. And we also the setback. Um, if if you, you've got a, a, a landform which collapses, it will generally bite backwards or step backwards. Uh, that's another uh, 
area that, that we're interested in, so we don't get people building their houses right on the edge of a cliff, at the top of a cliff, because that, that land could uh, fail, but they might be on a horizontal bit of land, what could go wrong. So the tools that we've developed identify those areas as well as that the case of a house right at the bottom of a cliff where the cliff could actually fall on them. That's the extreme analogy. Of course, there's the cartography is another aspect of the process and then compiling the digital data sets. So uh, we work with conceptual geological models such as this. This is up at Deviant where we've got several houses uh, on the move, one, one destroyed. Um, we need to understand that whole landscape, not just the surface, but under, under the, the, the ground as well. The hydrogeology, quite important. Often we don't have a lot of information on that, but we map springs, for example, um, and, and try to relate all these features that we see in the landscape into a model. Um, I just threw this in in terms of uh, the analysis to get those parameter se selections. The, um, for a, a data set of landslides of polygons, um, this is a slope analysis on, on each of those individual polygons. The, the red line is, uh, sorry, the blue line is when you use a, a 10 meter dim. When you use a 25 meter, I think it is, dim, um, you get a, a different answer. Um, so you've got to actually choose your parameters for the, the resolution you're using. And uh, these sort of cumulative frequency analyses are another way of, of trying to work out thresholds, statistically valid thresholds for parameter selection. Um, just, just explaining the uh, the deep-seated landslide, those runouts and set, setbacks that I was talking about before. Um, yeah, here's my cursor. Um, so uh, I'll just move that to there. So if that's that red line is our original landscape um, and we have a failure, the landscape might end up looking like that, if that makes sense. So uh, we need to identify this primary area on the hillside, which is above that slope threshold that I talked about before, but then also work out the uh, extent of the runout as well as, which is run out area here, as well as the regression area upside. So these sorts of tools are not built into standard spatial um, buttons, that you, functions that, that you find we've had to write them ourselves. And we use a shadow angles to, to um, as our approximation of how far these things are. So we need to understand well, what's a typical run out angle um, for, for these sorts of landslides and what's a typical setback. It's a bit of trial and error to get something which um, gives you an acceptable result. So what are the tools we use? Well, um, this is a bit of a, an evolution of software similar to other <coughs> talks. Started out with it, with the, um, the ArcView uh, written in, um, with, uh, in the Avenue language. Um, had to migrate to ArcGIS desktop, um, converted things over into VBA, uh, used things like Model Builder and ShellStab, which was a script that worked in, uh, within ArcGIS. But there's an ongoing story of upgrades, you know, new versions of, of Esri and, and so forth. Um, the the, the ShellStab no longer worked after a while, so we went, I went to Matt Window which was an open source uh, GIS um, that worked great. Then something happened, the new operating system no longer worked. Um, so I moved, I made a choice decision to move uh, out of the, uh, the uh, VBA uh, uh, environment for the scripts that I'd written in ArcGIS and went to GDAL and NumPy, that was a good move, um, and just ran them outside of, of ESRI. Um, using Python uh, inter interface. Um, but more recently, as security uh, within uh, government agencies uh, um, becoming such a, a, a huge issue, uh, running some of these tools, um, installing, say, Python using a, a wheel or whatever, um, uh, Pipey and, and so forth, it just became a nightmare. Our, our um, 
IT support couldn't do it. There's just firewalls and all sorts of obstacles. So um, just more recently, I've, I've moved, um, it re re rewrote my, um, my Python scripts. It just adapted them to run within QGIS because QGIS I can download. It's got all the, the um, SciPy and um, NumPy arrays and all those sort of things all built in. It's just great. It makes it really easy. I'm now trying to uh, convert away, move out of model builder into graphical modeler. Not quite as good, but it, it does. It, it's getting there. Um, I also use other programs like Rocky for 2D is a really good one. You have to be a member of a society. It doesn't cost much, but the, the software is thrown. And this is a, an amazing Rocky for program. And um, also using a program called Riverflow 2, 2D. That's proprietary, but recently they've moved there, um, moved away from using a proprietary front end. They now you use QGIS as their front end. And um, so it's it's actually a smart move by software developers to, uh, rather than creating their own front end, to use an open source one. Then, you know, you pay for your, pay for their product at the back end. Um, so, you know, the standard sort of uh, Python scripts uh, very easy to write, convert them to run directly in um, in QGIS. So I had to move from Python 2.7 to 3, but that wasn't a hard thing to do. It's to print command and a couple of other things. Uh, syntax is different. Um, and getting into the um, cartography, I'm finishing the Evandale uh, South Launceston map here. So here's an example of what what the geomorphology map is, is starting to look like. I'm nearly nearly there. So conclusions, um, I've used a range of both proprietary and, um, and FOSS tools over the, over the years um, as you know, this evolution of, of programming languages, operating systems, etc. cetera. Um, it's just a matter of having to continually keep pace with that and you end up with uh, time software obsolescence. Um, so, as I said, uh, learning to program in VBA, that was my first programming environment. That was hard, um, but then it, it gets easier once you've got that background. Um, moving to Python is a whole lot, a lot less challenging, all these dim statements and things you don't need to do and so forth. Um, and so my, my feeling is that with, with the FOSS, using a FOSS tools, um, you've got transparency, repeatability and longevity although you never get on immortality, but you get the closest you can to it. Um, and just to repeat what I said, you know, that the whole firewall issue within within government departments, I know in, in UTAS, I think you also have um, some quite um, strict, secure environments that stop you from using functions. Um, it's in the industry as well. Um, so that's I found that QGIS has been able to sort of um, get get around that problem. And of course, there's ongoing um, tools being developed. But I just thought I'd, and I'm not talking about hardware, GPU software and all that um, hardware and so forth, that's another topic. So some final words of wisdom before I finish. Um, there's no insurance cover in Australia for landslide damage, and I've got a little asterisk there. There are some special cases, but in Tasmania um, or any, anywhere in Australia, if, if you lose your house through landslide damage, you wear the cost, and um, that, that can be quite tragic. There's no mandatory disclosure provisions in Tasmania, so if you uh, rock up to a real estate agent who's trying to sell you this amazing house, they don't they're not required to tell you whether there's a history of landslide movement or not. And I'm seeing people buying and selling and today's market's been so hot. Uh, people are flogging off uh, houses, uh, properties with, with issues in order to escape and uh, other people are buying into them. It's, uh, it's not good. There's no cooling off provision. So Tasmania and Western Australia share the, the record uh, or the title of or honor of having probably the worst real estate uh, laws in the country. So if I, forgive me if I sound like your parent, before you buy your home, 
do your due diligence and check out our mapping. And if you think the price is too good to be true, well, there is. Thank you. Have you thought about uh, like out with the GoPro and actually doing the activity and, and uh, doing the instructional videos and doing you know, the details? Because sometimes just seeing something like that, you, you look at YouTube and sometimes they don't show you the intricate details or involved in why you do certain steps and all that. Have you thought about doing something like that where um, I like the very detailed instruction that's a just one video? I guess I'm thinking of if I if I had a like a body camera like police do and, and every time I went out the field I had that running. That's actually probably not a bad idea because you know you you are collecting information with your eyes and ears and whatever, but there's always something that's you know, so maybe that, that's something that yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a good idea. You know, we're obviously using drones and things and have to try our first uh, LIDAR Growing next week, um, size. Uh, um. The other one was on in terms of the Tasmania. And there's a lot of the traditional field work, like ground penetrating radars and stuff like that. Um, are they being used more in the actual field to look at the actual settings of where they're actually arranged and all that? Um, because you've got the gravitational effect that would be different depending on the how long. There's a range of ge geophysical tools out there, and LIDAR is a geophysical tool. Um, depending on the purpose, what I'm doing is at regional scale, and you wouldn't be carting around a GPR unit you know, yeah. on a day to day basis. But the, Whoever the geotech who's doing that site inspection may may decide that is the tool to answer a problem. Um, so you could wrap it up. Can we um, thank you, Colin, very much? No worries. Thank you. And please, folks, there is food to be eaten outside, which I'd be loving to eat.